Welcome to the Tom Nelson podcast. Today I have William Van Weingarten here. And uh, William, could you tell us a little bit about yourself to get us going? Certainly. Good morning. I'm a professor at York University in Toronto, Canada in the physics department. Uh, my educational background is I did a, a physics undergraduate degree as, long, as well as a computer science undergraduate degree at the University of Windsor. And then I went to Princeton where I got a master's and PhD in physics. I've been professor of York and in physics for the, over 30 years. Uh, for about the last 15 years, I've done a fair bit of research in climate change, uh, most recently working with Will Happer of Princeton. Very good. And you have a presentation that you can uh, give here? Certainly. Well, we're interested in climate change, specifically these greenhouse gases. And so that means we're looking at the atmosphere. So in the picture before you, you see a picture taken by a satellite of the Earth, and this small blue haze is the atmosphere that we're concerned with. Now, when you talk about greenhouse gases, we're talking about gases such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, ozone, nitrous oxide, otherwise known as laughing gas and methane. Sunlight can go through these gases, so these gases are transparent to sunlight, but they absorb heat or what we call infrared radiation. And so what we have done is we look at how infrared radiation uh, is transmitted through this layer of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Now, uh, the concern I guess in the world is that the uh, greenhouse gases in our atmosphere have been increasing. Here are some measurements taken at Mauna Loa in Hawaii uh, the reason why people go to Mauna Loa is not necessarily to take a vacation in Hawaii, but it's better to take an instrument measurement there rather than in some polluted area of the world. So measurements in Hawaii probably are a better representation of the average greenhouse gas concentrations over the globe. And what you see, let me start on the right of CO2. You see since 1960 to 2020, the CO2 has increased from about 320 parts per million to about 415 parts per million in the present day. Uh, methane has also gone up, but less steady. We see that there was a great slowing of methane uh, increase in the uh, years from about 2000 to 2010. That is not very well understood. Uh, one reason that's been proposed is the Russians cleaned up their leaky gas pipelines I'm not entirely certain whether I buy that. So there's still some work to do understanding why methane concentration is increasing, sometimes leveling off and more recently increasing again. Nitrous oxide has increased from about 300 parts per billion to 330 parts per billion over the last 40 years. Uh, this is a product or byproduct of fertilizer use. And I'll be talking more about that uh, later on. Now, if you uh, ask where does the CO2 come from, this comes from burning fossil fuels. And so you take carbon in the form of coal, oil, or natural gas. This burns with oxygen in the atmosphere to produce CO2. So what is kind of interesting, here are some measurements of ALERT Canada. ALERT is very far in the Canadian north, about 80 degrees latitude north, near the North Pole. And you see the black curve. Uh, the CO2 goes up. Because the carbon combines with oxygen, you see a slight decrease in the oxygen level as well. Now, you may notice that the oxygen decrease is about 90 parts per million. This is the decrease over the last 20 years or so. This is greater than the CO2 increase. You probably ask, why aren't the two the same? And the reason is a lot of the carbon dioxide goes into plants or it is absorbed by the ocean. So that's why the CO2 increases less than the oxygen decrease. Now you probably noticed that the CO2 goes up and down every year and ask why. And the reason is that plants absorb CO2 in the spring and the summer when they grow. When the plants decay in the fall and the winter, uh, the CO2 goes up because of the rotting vegetation. Uh, there is more land mass in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, and that's why you see this uh, seasonal variation in the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. 
And here you see a nice picture taken from satellite data showing in February, you see a lot of more CO2 concentration than you do in October. It's kind of interesting. In October, you see this big uh, CO2 hotspot. Uh, this is in Indonesia, and this is the result of a forest fire. So I thought this is kind of neat. It shows the uh, variation of the CO2 concentration with season. Now, uh, people are, of course, interested in CO2 concentration and temperature for many uh, years. And the oldest data is taken from these Antarctic ice cores. So basically what they do is they drill a very deep hole, and then they take a core of ice shown on the right here. Now, what happens is when you have a, a region of Antarctica, you get snow every year. The snow progressively gets compacted with additional layers of snow each year coming on top. And so uh, you have dust particles. So if you look back in this ice core, it's like looking at tree ring data. And so you can count the rings corresponding to each year deposition of snow, which eventually turns out to be uh, compactified into ice. You can look at the trapped ice bubbles and measure the CO2 concentration. And we, when people have done this, you see in the bottom graph, the CO2 variations, it goes up and down in time. Next, what people have done is they've looked at temperature. Now, how do they do that? Well, it turns out that there are two isotopes of oxygen, oxygen 18 and oxygen 60. What does that mean? Oxygen 18 has two more neutrons in its nucleus than oxygen 60. So it's slightly heavier. So if you take a water molecule on the ocean and it likes to evaporate, it takes a bit more energy to evaporate an oxygen 18 molecule or in the form of water, which has an oxygen 18 atom, than water with oxygen 16. So a water molecule with oxygen 18 will tend to evaporate more easily at a higher temperature than a water molecule with oxygen 16. So by looking at the concentration of the ice stove, uh, O18 versus O16 in the ice, you can get a measure of the temperature. And that's this curve at the top. And at first glance, you say, my, those two curves, the CO2 and the temperature graphs, they nicely go in sync. When the CO2 is higher, the temperature is higher, as you can see all over. But when people look at a very careful analysis, they see that the CO2 goes up only about 500 to 800 years after the temperature has gone up. So these spikes in the temperature come about 500 to 800 years before the spikes in the CO2. So this is not what you would expect with this global warming theory that says we get more CO2, this causes the temperature to go up. Uh, in case you're wondering what causes this, well, if you have the temperature going up, it's like you take a pop bottle where you have trapped CO2, you heat it, and you see these bubbles of CO2 coming up. So if you have the ocean, it has a lot of dissolved CO2, the temperature goes up, you would naturally expect after the temperature to go up, some of the CO2 to come out of the oxygen into the atmosphere. That's what we believe accounts for these two graphs. Now, we have done a lot of calculations, and I'm sorry if this bores your readers, what I'm going to show is just the basis of calculations. You can look at our references to understand this, but if you're not a physicist, just please skip this graph. Now, how does the atmosphere work? Well, over on the left side here, we have a graph of temperature versus altitude. So at the surface, the temperature of the Earth is about 15 Celsius or about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's of course the average temperature of the earth. Sometimes in the tropics it's warmer, in the polar regions it's cooler. Now, if you are at the surface and it is hot, what we always like to do in our summer vacation is go to the mountains, it's higher up and it's cooler. So as you go up in altitude, the temperature goes down. Now, if you go up between 10 and 20 kilometers, which is about 
10 miles up in the atmosphere where planes fly, the temperature levels up. And then if you go still higher in altitude, the temperature increases. And the reason for this is you have a layer of ozone. Ozone gas likes to absorb ultraviolet light coming from the sun, and this heats the atmosphere. So the temperature goes up when you got into the stratosphere. And then if you go still higher, above 60 kilometers or so, then the temperature goes down because there is very little atmosphere left. Now, what we do in our calculations is we consider the dependence of temperature on the altitude. Next, we also consider the concentrations of the various gases with altitude. And that is what's shown on the right panel. So blue here is water vapor. You see there's a lot of water vapor at the surface of the Earth. But then as you go up in altitude, it gets colder. Water freezes. It condenses in the form of snow and rain. And so at a higher altitude, there is much less water vapor. Carbon dioxide, this is about constant at 400 parts per million throughout the atmosphere. And then you add these other gases. This brown curve is... Uh, ozone. You see there isn't that much at the surface, but there is a lot more at the, uh, in the stratosphere at an altitude of about 35 kilometers. And similarly, we had consider methane, the black curve, and the green curve, nitrous oxide or laughing. Now, in our calculations, we look at the absorptions of each of these gases, these five greenhouse gases, water vapor, carbon dioxide, ozone, nitrous oxide, and methane. And they have lots of these infrared colors that they absorb. Like. So here we have frequency. Frequency is just a fancy scientific word for color. And these are color in the infrared region. The human eye can't absorb, can't see these infrared colors. I guess our cats, they can see somewhat in the infrared. So I guess this is what a, a cat having very good uh, vision in the infrared can see. And you see about uh, tens of thousands of these different infrared colors that we have to take account into our calculations. Let me skip that one. Now, when we do that, we look at the heat that is coming out of the Earth's atmosphere. And that's shown at the top right here. And so flux is just a fancy word for heat per square meter. How much energy per square meter per second or watts per square meter comes out at the top of the atmosphere? And if we had a transparent atmosphere with no greenhouse gases, we would get this nice little continuous blue curve. Now, if we add in our water vapor, our CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, we get this uh, black curve over here. Now, you see in this region between 0 and 500 wave numbers, wave numbers is, again, a fancy word for infrared color measurement, you see that the water vapor tends to uh, absorb some of the infrared light. And then there's this big dip around 660 wave numbers, and that's due to CO2. So to emphasize that, we've also calculated the curve where we had no CO2 in the atmosphere. That's the green curve. So you see there's a huge difference between our green curve without any carbon dioxide and our black curve where we have our 400 parts per million uh, CO2, which we now have in our atmosphere. Over at a thousand wave numbers, you see the big effect of ozone. And then over here, beyond 1300 wave numbers, you see the effect of methane and N2O and again, water vapor. Now, the question you probably have is how, why should we pay attention to you? How do you know, scientists, that you've done the calculations correct? And people have had some satellite observations. These were taken in the early 1970s. And this satellite looked over the Sahara. And over on the top right, you see the heat signature that they saw from the Sahara. And what we've now done is calculated what we expect that signature to be. And if you compare the observations taken on the right with our model on the left, you see a very close agreement. And I should emphasize, we don't have any silly fudge factors to try to match our model to the observations. We just take the 
observed concentration of the greenhouse gases, the temperature profile that you see when you go up in altitude over the Sahara, and that's how we calculate. So there's very good agreement between the Sahara, the model, and the observations. When you look at the Mediterranean, we also get good agreement. You'll notice that now we have a less heat or less intensity. So our vertical scale goes from zero to 150, whereas it went from zero to 200 over the Sahara. Obviously, if it's cooler, you get less heat produced. When we go to the Antarctica, we again get very nice agreement between the model and observations, but now notice the vertical scale on intensity goes from zero to 60. Because it's very cold in the Antarctic, you get far less heat produced. So it's when we see this good agreement between our calculations and our observations, we think we know what we're doing. Now, what you can do is you can add up the various contributions due to the heat from all the different frequencies, and then you can make a, a plot of the flux or the heat per square meter versus altitude, and then you get this curve shown here. Now, we can do this calculation for an atmosphere with 400 parts per CO2, or we can say, now let's double the CO2, and that curves almost overlap. The difference in this heat coming out at the top of the atmosphere at about 86 kilometers, when we double our CO2, this is something climate people like to call the forcing. And this is about three watts per square meter. And our calculation agrees very well with what other people calculate. Other people have calculated about 2.8 instead of three watts per square meter. Let me skip that one. Now, one of the questions we sometimes get is, uh, we hear that CO2 saturates. What does that mean? Well, we calculated this graph to try to show this. So again, this is a plot of our heat flux, our power per square meter versus our infrared color. So the blue curve, this is the curve that you get if you had no greenhouse gases. The green curve is when we have our water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone, but no CO2, zero parts per million CO2. So you see this green curve, et cetera, here. Now let's add a bit of CO2. First, we put in 50. Then you get this light blue curve. It overlaps with the green, except in this region around 650 wavelengths. Now let's double CO2 up to 100 parts per million. Then you get the dark blue curve. There's very little difference between the light blue and dark blue. Double again to 200 per million, you get purple. Double to 400 per million, which is the uh, concentration in our atmosphere approximately, you get the black curve. Double it yet again, we get 800 parts per million, we get the red curve. So you see all those curves almost overlap. And this is what we call the saturation, that increase in CO2 is not as terrible as people might offhand think. People sometimes think if I double something, there's a doubling in the temperature, and that is not occurring. So because of this saturation, the temperature warming that you get goes as the logarithm of the concentration change. Now, this has been known for over a century. Uh, Svante Arrhenius, a Swedish uh, a scientist, he discovered this. Now, what does this mean? Uh, a logarithm basically means if I have a warming S due to doubling CO2, to get an additional warming S or 2S, I have to double CO2 again. So if I increase the CO2 concentration from 400 to 800 parts per million, I can get, say, a warming of S, which the IPCC says is about three degrees. To get a warming of 2S, I have to increase the CO2 from 800 to 1600 parts per million. To get a warming of 3S, I have to go from 1600 to 3200 parts per million. When you start to talk about CO2 increases that large, it's extremely difficult to do. Okay, so here is a plot of that little formula. The warming is S, the climate sensitivity times the logarithm base two of that concentration change. And here I've shown various curves of the warming for various values of S. S equals three is the value that the IPCC uh, says is probably realistic. Uh, 
our calculations so show something more between one and two. So if S is two, you get the blue curve. So here we plot the warming versus CO2 concentration change. Here, the uh, curve, the black dot, 68 years, says how long it would take to get a warming of two degrees at present increases of CO2. 96 years would say how long would it take if S equals three to get a temperature increase of two, year, uh, two degrees, et cetera. So under the IPCC, assuming CO2 continues to increase at the present rate, in about 100 years, you would expect temperature at the surface of the Earth to go up by two degrees. If S is two, you'd expect 164 years. S is uh, one, you'd expect about 492 years. Now, what I've shown you so far is due to a clear sky. And a clear sky is not very realistic. And at the top left, you see a picture of the Earth taken from space. This is a famous picture taken by the Apollo astronauts. And it's a very pretty picture. It's known as a blue marble. And you don't just see blue ocean and brown land. You saw see a lot of white, which means clouds. In fact, at any time, about two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered by clouds. So our calculations, which were done for a clear sky, don't take into clouds. And you probably wonder, how is that going to affect things? Well, on the top right, you see a picture of some data taken by a satellite uh, over the Western Pacific. Uh, this one curve here shows the clear sky signature. So again, this is heat versus infrared color. And this picture below is the signature with a cloudy sky. And there is a huge difference. Now, the clear sky, we can model that. and We've done that here below. Uh, green here is when I have no CO2. Black is for 400 parts per million CO2. Red is for 800 parts per million CO2. So the difference between the red and the black curve is what we call the forcing. And this is about three watts per square meter. Now, if we take the curve with clouds, we can model that also quite well. It's rather boring. You just see a little blip here with CO2. This other blip is due to ozone. You can then do the calculation. What happens if we double CO2? And I've blown that up right here. So the difference between the red-black curve, that's red with doubling CO2 concentration. And if you take the difference between the red and the black curve, you get the forcing. But now with clouds, you get a forcing of minus uh, 0.6 watts per square meter. No, this is, this is negative, not positive. A negative forcing means you're going to get cool. Now, this negative forcing only occurs for some clouds. Some clouds are going to give you warming. The point of this slide is to show clouds are going to have a very big perturbation on your climate, and they are going to reduce the forcing of CO2 quite significantly. Let me talk briefly about this global warming potential. This is something that was developed by the IPCC about 30 years ago, and it uh, basically takes that forcing that I talked about divides by the mass of the molecule in question. And then it also considers how long that molecule stays in the atmosphere. And so the intent here is to try to come up with a measure of the global warming effectiveness of various greenhouse gases compared to CO2. Now, let me just talk a little bit about the table below where I have the gas, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and the lifetime. Uh, the lifetime of CO2 in the atmosphere, that's a bit complicated. There is various processes that take out CO2 from the atmosphere. We know trees grow every year. There is also a transfer of CO2 in the oceans. The oceans transfer the CO2 to the bottom. So these the CO2 going out of the atmosphere, there are a variety of processes which take time scales from one to year to centuries. So we take that into account. So star star means there's a bit of a complicated formula that I'm not putting into this slide. If you want to see it, you can look up our reference. Methane has a lifetime of about 12 years in atmosphere. A laughing gas or nitrous oxide, about 109 years in our atmosphere. So you can then calculate 
using this form of the global warming potential, you can look at the global warming potential at zero years from when you put in the greenhouse gas, 20 years later, 100 years. So CO2 has a global warming potential of one by definition. Uh, methane has a greenhouse gas global warming potential at 85 years compared to CO2. Uh, for 20 years, 53.9, 100 years, 19.2. So it's getting less with time because methane doesn't last that long in the atmosphere. Nitrous oxide has a longer lifetime, so its global warming potential doesn't change that much. So these are the figures that you sometimes hear uh, that methane has a global warming potential of 85 relative to uh, CO2, laughing gas 233 relative to CO2, and these numbers uh, tend to scare folks. Uh, now, the IPC also has some global warming potentials. Uh, our values for nitrous oxide are pretty close to theirs. Our values for the methane disagree somewhat. And the reason it disagrees, I believe, is the IPCC says when we have methane in our atmosphere, it sometimes oxidizes. When it oxidizes, it creates water vapor and CO2. That oxidized products, the water vapor and CO2 coming originally from the methane, act as global warming gases. And we're going to add to the methane global warming effect those products from the methane oxidation. Global warming potential, I don't think, is a very useful concept. When you go outside, you don't ask your wife or husband, honey, what's the global warming potential outside? Do I need to put on a jacket? You want to know what's the warming. So that's what we've done here. We've considered the various greenhouse gases here, the concentrations at the present day. We look at the increase of these greenhouse gases. So CO2 has a present concentration about 410 parts per million. It's increasing at about 2.5 part per million per year or 2,500 part per billion per year. The doubling time is about 160 years. For methane, we have about 1.9 parts per million in the atmosphere. It's increasing at about 8 part per billion per year over the last two decades. Again, if I go back 30 years, methane leveled off. So for this calculation, we considered a relatively large increase in methane. The doubling time is about 238 parts, uh, 238 years. Laughing gas, about 320 parts per million. Uh, it's increasing about 0.8 part per billion per year. The doubling time is about over 400 years. Now we can calculate what's the effectiveness of the warming and we like to consider one molecule at a time. So we're going to consider what is the effectiveness of the warming of a molecule of CO2 compared to a molecule of CO2, that's one. When you consider methane, one methane molecule added to the atmosphere has about 30 times a more warming than one methane of C, one molecule of CO2. If you consider nitrous oxide, one N2O molecule addition has about 230 times more warming than one additional CO2 molecule. And these numbers, 131 and 233, everyone agrees with, even the IPCC folks. The problem, however, is we are not just adding one more molecule of methane compared to one more molecule of CO2. We're adding about 300 times more CO2 molecules than methane molecules. So the effect of the warming of methane is 31 divided by the 300, which is about one tenth that of CO2. So if you look at CO2 increasing, you can estimate this is, uh, if, you, if the warming is about one degree C per century due to all these greenhouse gases, about the effect of methane is about one-tenth that of CO2. So it's, the increase of CO2 is about 0.85 per century, 0.85 degrees Celsius per century. Methane, 
it's 31 divided by the 300, 300 factors, the much greater increase of CO2 than methane, it's about 0.085 degrees per century. If we consider nitrous oxide, well, we're producing about 3,000 times more CO2 than nitrous oxide. So we take this number 233 divided by 3,000, and you get about 0.064 degrees per century. If we add these all up, you get about 1 degree C per century. So the 1 degree C per century, this is about what the observation have shown the warming has been over the last few decades. If you don't like this number one and you say, oh, this is too conservative, it should be 1.5, well, then just increase all these uh, values by 50%. And in the case of nitrous oxide, you're still getting warming of less than a tenth of a degree per century. So this is rather small. Now, why is that important? Well, nitrous oxide comes from fertilizer. So some of the fertilizer goes into the ground, uh, eventually decomposes mainly to give you nitrogen gas and two, but a little bit of N2O. Well, uh, some countries have said, let's stop using fertilizer. Well, why is fertilizer important? Well, here's a graph showing the yield of various crops uh, in time from 1850 to the present. So the uh, light blue curve, this is corn. And you see there's been a huge increase of corn by about a factor of six in the last uh, 50 years. Uh, wheat, an increase of about five. Uh, barley, increase about three. And this closely parallels the dash blue curve, which is the use of nitrogen fertilizer. So the question is, if you want to stop using fertilizer because you're worried about this nitrous oxide, that basically means your agricultural yields are going to go down by a factor of four or so. This is a huge decrease in world food production. And are you really going to do that when the temperature rise because of this fertilizer use is less than a tenth of a degree per century? Uh, this strikes me as rather silly. The experiment has already been done in Sri Lanka. And what happened in Sri Lanka was the government said, you're not allowed to use fertilizers. The agricultural community produced much less food. There was less food available. And this resulted in riots, resulting in the president or prime minister having to flee the country. So it was a disaster. Uh, there are now some countries like in Holland, uh, Canada, where prime ministers also want to sharply curtail fertilizer use. And this, uh, I think, should be met with great caution. Now, uh, one thing that people don't realize when you have more CO2 in the atmosphere is it has a lot of beneficial effects. And plants grow faster. So on the top here, you see an experiment uh, by this man, Itso. He took a uh, pine tree and grew it in ambient CO2 uh, environment. So basically had a plastic bag where he controlled how much CO2 was in the bag. Then he took uh, this plastic bag and put 150 more parts per CO2 than there is at present. And you see the tree has grown a lot faster. Then he put 300 parts per million more. So I guess it's 400 plus 300, about 750 parts per million CO2 in the bag grew faster, 400 parts per million, a very dramatic effect on the plant growth. Now there's another effect that's more subtle. It turns out that when you have more CO2 in the atmosphere, the stomata, the holes in the leaves through which the CO2 is uh, absorbed into the plant, they shrink. And basically it's the same effect if you have a lot of uh, food in front of a table of teenagers, their mouths shrink because they don't have to have such a big mouth to get all their food. Well, plants are the same way. The, the stomata size shrinks. Why is that important? Well, if the stomata gets smaller, then the water loss from the plant leaf is less. So a plant can grow with less water. And this is particularly important if you're in the dry regions of the earth. And this effect has already been observed, and that's shown in the bottom figure. Green means the enhancement of growth 
over the last 30 years due to this effect. This was observed by a NASA satellite. So more CO2 helps the plant grow faster because CO2 is plant food. It also reduces the demand of water, which helps plants to grow in arid regions. So more CO2 can have some very interesting effects. Next, let's look at the, uh, what does the data say. Here we show plots of temperature increase versus year for the last 150 years. These are five different data sets. And what is kind of interesting is temperatures were about flat from 1850 to about 1900. And then they increased from uh, 1900 or to about 1940 by about half a degree. No one knows why. Then from about 1940 uh, to about 1975, temperatures dipped or remained flat. Why? It certainly doesn't agree with the global warming theory that says if we have more CO2, temperatures go up. And then from the 1975 to about 2000, temperatures went up by half a degree. But we were all told this is, shows how bad we are for the environment. This is all due to CO2. And then a surprise happened. From 2000 to about 2016, temperatures leveled off. This was completely unexpected. The global climate models did not predict this. People said, what caused this hiatus? We still don't know. And more recently, there has been an increase in temperature. So this decadal fluctuation does not disprove that CO2 causes warming. It does. But it shows there is something else going on that we don't quite understand. Maybe the sun uh, changes the amount of energy it sends to the Earth. Maybe there are ocean currents that have very dramatic effects. So this gives us some reason to be humble as scientists about our understanding about the climate system. Now, there are these climate models, and I'd like to briefly talk about these. When you look at the Earth's atmosphere, the global warming theory says that the greatest warming will not occur at the surface, but will occur at about 11 kilometers above the surface in a region called the tropopause. Um, the reason for this, I hope I'm not getting too technical, is that if you take a sample of air at the surface and have this go up in altitude, it will cool. The cooling depends on how much water vapor there is. If it is dry air, the cooling uh, is about 9.8 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Now, if it is wet, the cooling is about six and a half degrees Celsius per kilometer. It's less because you have this water vapor as the air cools, the water vapor condenses and falls out in the form of rain or snow. So this water vapor has a lot of heat that is going to slow the cooling. Now, if you take one of these samples and increase the temperature, so here I see my cursor at the red curve and I increase a little bit to the yellow curve. So I take a sample of air at the surface and increase it. And then I look at the sample as it goes up to 11 kilometers. You see that this temperature difference between the red curve and this yellow curve is more at this 11 kilometer altitude than at the surface. This is greater by a factor of two or so. And this shows that the warming is much greater as, at this tropopause at this 11 kilometer altitude than at the surface. So when people look at these models, they say, let's compare the predicted warming at the tropopause compared to what's actually been going on. And down on the bottom, we see 39 different models, these red curves, and we see the, the temperature increase. And these models uh, predict temperatures at the tropopause to increase by about 0.3 to 0.6 degrees C per decade. The average is the black curve of all these models, about 0.4 degrees C per decade. Well, what's been observed? Less than half that, this white curve. So all of these models greatly overestimate the uh, warming. And these are the models that are used in these IPCC reports. And that's why we recommend that some caution should be considered uh, when you consider the models. Why are the models so wrong? 
It's not that the people working on them are bad people. It's a very difficult problem. Those are competent people. The main problem we everyone suspect is going to be clouds. We don't quite know how to take clouds into those global warming calculations. The other thing besides a temperature is people get worried about precipitation because obviously if it stops raining because there's global warming, this has a terrible effect on food supply. So a few years ago, I looked at the precipitation measurements for the last few hundred years. There are about 800 stations, these black dots around the world where I could get several hundred years of data. And then I averaged the precipitation compared to this 30 year period of 1961, 1990 to try to see if there was any change. Uh, red is the average of these annual uh, black dots. And you see this red curve just bounces up and down. Basically, there's no change over time. Uh, blue here shows where most of the measurements are taken. We have most of these precipitation measurements after 1850. So you just see this red curve bounces around in this period from 1750 to 1850. That probably is because there isn't much data around here. But there is no dramatic change in precipitation going on. Uh, I also looked at various areas of the uh, earth. If you look at India, Pakistan from 1800 to the present day, there's no significant change in precipitation. The red curve is just this five-year average of the black annual dots. I did notice, however, a big decrease in 1900. And when I saw this 50% decrease in precipitation in India, Pakistan in 1900, I thought, is that possible? because if you have such a decrease, you're going to have a huge effect on your agricultural productivity. And I remember struggling. I thought maybe I have a mistake on my computer program, but I thought, no, that's simple. That doesn't make sense. So finally, I Googled 1900 India famine. It comes up right away. The monsoons failed, and they think several hundred thousand to even over a million people starved to death. And as I was walking across campus a few days later, I bumped into a friend of mine who's from India, and I told him about this. And he looked at me and he said, of course, William, haven't you learned in history that there's famine in, in 1900 caused so many people to starve in India? And I kind of had to, you know, scrunch down, embarrassed and say, no, my history class only taught me that the big event in 1900 that was that Queen Victoria was dying because we learned history from a British perspective. If you look in California, uh, California is basically a desert. Uh, so there's quite a bit of fluctuation year to year in the uh, precipitation. If you take the five-year average, you also see this fluctuates up and down a lot. But there is no overall trend for the last 150 years. So sometimes you talk, you know, you hear this talk about California is becoming a desert. Well, a few years later, they have too much rain. Uh, of course, the problem in California is a desert, population is growing, growing population needs water use, and that's difficult to come in a desert area. Another thing people like to talk about is forest fires. And they say, well, things are drying up, we get more forest fires. Well, if you look in Canada, if you look at the black curve, which gives you the number of major forest fires for the last 30 years, it's been going down. Uh, if you look at the area burned each year in the red, there's no trend up. So some years you get more forest fires, some years you get less. Of course, you have to be a bit careful with this because uh, people have intervened in the forest ecosystems enormously. They have tried to suppress fires. If you suppress fires, you get a buildup of flammable material. So then when you do get a forest fire, you get a much bigger forest fire than you otherwise would have got. So forest fires, be very cautious when you hear all this talk about the gloom and doom that they are increasing. Uh, another thing you hear about global warming is that there are more extreme events. Well, let's look at hurricanes. This is the right figure. Uh, the top shows the total number of hurricanes in the last 40 years, not much of a change. The number of severe hurricanes, also no change. Some years you get a few more hurricanes, other years less. Tornadoes, most tornadoes in the world occur in the uh, United States where you have the cold air from Canada coming with colliding with warm air from the Gulf of Mexico. If you look in the last uh, 25 years or so, uh, 
A total number of tornadoes, not much difference, no change. Strong tornadoes, some years more, some years less, no overall change. So there's been no increase in extreme events. Next, people are scared about the polar ice caps. If you have warming, obviously your ice melts. And we have data from uh, for the polar and Antarctic ice caps for the last uh, 40 years or so from satellites. And the satellite show that the Arctic ice goes up and down every year, but there is this definite downward trend. And this red curve shows the uh, September ice trend, and this has been going down for the last uh, 40 years. And you can extrapolate this red curve down, and this is going to reach zero ice in about September 2077. So this is, should be within the lifetime of our children. What is a bit puzzling is if you only look at the date of the last 15 years from 2007, uh, and then you get this dashed curve from fitting to the data, it's horizontal. It shows no decrease. In fact, if you extrapolate this dash curve, uh, you predict the zero ice about 4,500 years later. Uh, so it seems that in 2007, something happened. I don't know what. I suspect what happened is you had a lot of storms. The storm swept out a lot of this thick ice out of the Arctic ice pack. And since then, the Arctic ice has been relatively stable. Uh, the Antarctic, it's actually gotten a little bigger. Uh, in recent years, there has been a bit of melting in that peninsula that juts up toward uh, the uh, South America. Nevertheless, I don't want to discount this. If you have warmer temperatures, you will get less ice. And I thought there was an interesting quote I found about an expedition sailed as far north as 81 degrees latitude. This is very far north in ice-free water. And they concluded the Arctic is not recognizable with the region of previous 50 years. Glaciers have been replaced by mounts of earth and snow. Great shoals of fish have disappeared and the seal population has been diminished. And this study was by G. Ift, The Changing Arctic, published in the Monthly Weather Review, uh, page 589. And uh, I guess I forgot the year. Uh, the year was 1922. So when I saw this, I thought you have to be a bit careful. Yes, Arctic ice has been decreasing but there have been periods of time where similar observations have been made. Um, another thing people are worried about is that land glaciers are disappearing. And you can see this when you make a cruise to Alaska, there's this place called Glacier Bay. My sister-in-law went on such a cruise. It's apparently really nice to see. You see dramatic pictures of, uh, or, or uh, you see dramatic glaciers, and these are melting away a very, uh, dramatic picture. So this cruise apparently is well worth taking. Now, the first person to take that cruise was George Vancouver in the late 1700s. And he couldn't go so far up this inlet because the glaciers extended almost entirely to the Pacific Ocean. And if you look at these red lines, so here's a map of this Glacier Bay, Alaska region. In about 1760, the glaciers were at the Pacific Ocean. 1794, they had melted. 1845, they had melted several tens of kilometers more. 1860, 1907, etc. A lot of this melting of about 50 kilometers or more occurred in the 1800s before 1950. It's impossible to argue that this is due to greenhouse gas increases. So again, much of this uh, glacial retreat has probably been a warming up the earth after the end of the little ice age, not due to greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases do cause some warming, but there's more things going on. Sea level increase. This has been well known to have been occurred for the last thousands of years since the ice age, last ice age ended about 10,000 years. If you look at maps of certain regions of the world, they have changed. Uh, here's a map of Holland. If you look at the map of Holland around 500 BC, there was not this inland sea, uh, which there is uh, a thousand years later. The Romans knew about this. Uh, they didn't want to go much above the Rhine. 
They knew this was a marshy region. They would then sink with their armor into the mud and the, the barbarians would then finish them off rather quickly. So if you look a thousand years later, uh, you start to see this formation of this inner sea, the present day of Holland, everything where you see red or purple is underwater. So if you didn't have dikes, you'd have a massive change in the map of Holland compared to 2,500 years ago. And that's because sea level has gone up. The, the Dutch are very interested in measuring sea level increase. So here you see sea level rise versus time. And you see it goes up by about two millimeters per year. And so they have uh, built dikes. Uh, here's a picture that's a bit uh, dear to me. This road here is a dike, which prevents the water going into inundate the floodland. Uh, this house on the right is actually my grandfather's house. And I thought it was kind of in interesting. Looking across the road, I saw this farmhouse. And you see this farmhouse is embedded in the dike. When this farmhouse was built a few hundred years ago, it, they could open their front door. But then they had to increase the height of the dike to prevent the flooding. And they increased the dike so much that people here can't even open their front door because uh, that was done to prevent the flooding. So much of this sea level increase has been going on for thousands of years. It is a natural process. Greenhouse gases, yes, can exacerbate this a little bit, but are not responsible for this huge level of sea level increase that we've seen over the last few thousand years. Sea level increase is going up by about two, three millimeters per year, or about a foot per century. Uh, one of the things that people have uh, worried about is if we have this more CO2 in the atmosphere, it goes into our oceans. More CO2 in the oceans causes our oceans to become a bit more acidic. And that means we can slowly turn the oceans into stomach acid, and then the poor fish are not going to be able to live. Well, you can do a calculation. Uh, here's some formula that maybe good high school students would know in terms of how water uh, dissociates into ions, H plus and OH minus. The H plus uh, turns out with uh, H2CO3, which comes from adding CO2 into the atmosphere to give you this uh, carbonic acid. HCO3 minus can dissociate. And you can do an estimate showing what happens if we increase CO2, how does this affect the pH, which is the measure of ocean acidification? And you get this curve of pH versus CO2 concentration. If we increase the CO2 in the atmosphere from about 280 to 400 parts per million, this is the increase of CO2 we've had for about the last 150 years. You see the pH is chained by about 0.13. If we double CO2 in the atmosphere, we expect uh, acidification of about 0.27. Now, is that significant? Well, people have taken some measurements. So here they have taken a graduate student and had him go up and down like a yo-yo for about five years and measure pH when he goes up and down, also measure temperature. And what you find is that when you are near the surface of the ocean, uh, there's uh, not that much CO2 because you have plants that are basically absorbing all the CO2 at the top layer of the ocean. So here you get a, a higher pH than lower in the ocean where you get less plant life because there's less sunlight going. So when you go deep down the ocean, you get uh, a slightly more acidic ocean. So this graduate student who goes up and down saw this uh, change in pH as you go down in the ocean. There's also a seasonal dependence. And if you look at the change in the pH when you go from zero to about 50 meters, this is comparable to the change in pH that you would expect if we double uh, the ocean pH. So this is not significant. So basically right now, if you take a sunbathing seal, he gets hungry, dives down to catch a fish for lunch. The change in pH that the sunbathing seal experiences is comparable to what you get when you double the ocean pH. Now, there are a lot of terrible things that we've been doing to the ocean, you know, dumping sewage in there, uh, have a lot of overfishing. I strongly oppose all those things. 
Those things are terrible. They need to stop right away. And I'm sure those things have a very detrimental effect on uh, important areas such as the Great Barrier Reef, etc. But you cannot say more CO2 is responsible for the end of the Great Barrier Reef, etc. So our conclusions are that increase in gases do cause some warming. If we take about one degree C per century, which we've seen is the temperature increase, and we extrapolate that for the 21st century, uh, we anticipate we'd have about 0.85 degrees C per century warming due to more CO2, methane 0.085 C per century, nitrous oxide 0.064, that sums up to about one degree. Again, if you don't like the one degree and you're saying it's more like one and a half, just multiply all those numbers by one and a half. Again, they are small. Uh, I'm going to be giving a talk in Holland where they want to shut down agriculture. And uh, Holland is a rather small place on the world, which everyone who is not Dutch knows. So if you say, what's the responsibility of all those Dutch people, you have to divide these numbers by something like factor of 300, and you see Holland has a rather minuscule effect on the world. If you ask who is responsible for most of this, it's going to be countries like China, uh, India, uh, the United States. So the evidence, uh, the wor world has warmed by about plus 1C since 1850. Uh, if you hear about scary climate models, they have a rather poor prediction record. There's been no same change in precipitation, storm, hurricane, tornado frequency, a slight ice increase in the Antarctic, a reduction in the Arctic since 1979, but there seems to be a recent stabilization of the Arctic ice. I don't know if that's going to continue. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, sea level, that's been going up two to three millimeters per year, nothing dramatic. So if you hear see these pictures that the Empire State Building or the Statue of Liberty is going to be submerged in 50 years, that's just silly. That's a science fiction movie. Ocean acidification is unlikely to affect marine life. So the world is not going to end in 10 years. Um, outlawing fertilizers or sharply reducing them this is very silly because it's going to reduce global food supply. Of course, it's silly to dump fertilizer into waterways. That's going to get you algae blooms, et cetera. So farmers are not dumb. They want to reduce their fertilizer costs. So more responsible use of fertilizer is an excellent idea. So farmers should try to reduce fertilizers or optimize fertilizers so that it enhances their crop growth and is not wasted going down the river. And you have to be aware of uh, unintended consequences. If, say, a country like the Netherlands, where farmers are very efficient, takes farms out of production, the world needs that food, that means you have to chop down, say, part of the Amazon rainforest. And a hectare of very fertile Dutch farmland is going to have to be replaced by many hectares of relatively infertile Amazonian rainforest. So you may be thinking you're helping the planet by having all these uh, climate regulations, but you may inadvertently be doing exactly the opposite. People sometimes like to say, what about all these nice people like Greta Thunberg and Al Gore? What's going on? And I always like to ask, well, I don't know what scientific calculation Al Gore or Ms. Thunberg have done. And they inadvertently seem to be contributing to some hysteria. And the question that I don't quite know how to answer is how does science combat hysteria? A teenager showed me an op-ed she had written uh, about global uh, climate strike organized by Ms. Thunberg. And I thought it was kind of interesting. Greta Thunberg can easily be termed the ideal leader of the global climate strike. The passionate young lady coming from a historically neutral country has inspired people around the world from all walks of life. Her courage and actions as well as words are heartening for everyone. I admire her ambition and will to speak up. She's doing more than most teenagers her age. However, I question if she really has any understanding of the science behind climate, given how much school she misses. The science of climate change is not fully understood by anyone, but the field is full of many people who enjoy making predictions that lack accuracy. 
Despite this, Greta has managed to appeal to a new generation to fight for issues such as pollution and irresponsible use of resources. Her global climate strike is about more than climate. It is about empowering young people to speak up and take an active role in shaping the kind of world we live in. And I thought this was kind of interesting, gives insight perhaps in what's going on. Thank you. Okay. So, William, I got to thank you. That was a brilliant presentation, uh, great graphics, and very well explained. So thank you for taking the time to do this. I do have a, two or three follow-up questions, if you have some time. Go ahead. One question is, uh, you mentioned that the temperature increase tends to happen first, then the CO2 goes up uh, naturally. But what percent of the CO2 increase since 1850 do you think may have been natural versus caused by humans? I think most of it has been uh, due to humans. That's why I put in this graph here where you see the increase in CO2, uh, which is shown here also at alert, and you see the decrease in oxygen. So this corresponds to taking fossil fuels like carbon uh, due to oil, natural gas, and burning it that would cause an oxygen to have a slight decrease in the atmosphere. So I believe the evidence is overwhelming that the increase in CO2 is due to fossil fuel uh, combustion. Moreover, if you look at this right graph of CO2 increase versus time, and if you look more carefully at it, you can also see uh, certain times where the CO2 increase slows down. And it slows down when there is a global economic recession, like in the early 1990s. So I think the evidence yeah. that the, much of the CO2, most of it, is produced by fossil fuel combustion is overwhelming. Uh, for methane, it's a bit more complicated because you also can get methane from natural sources. There is concern that if the permafrost melts, there is methane stored in that. Uh, so that may contribute. Uh, to methane increase. Uh, but again, uh, methane did not increase in this period from the late 1990s to the early 2000s, and we really don't understand this. So methane, we really don't quite understand too well. My second question is, since 1850, uh, what percent of that temperature rise has been caused by humans in your estimation? That's difficult to say. Yeah. Uh, the uh, increase that people see said is about one degree C. Mm -hmm. About half of that occurred before 1950. So if you say half of the increase of the temperature since 1850s, which we've seen since about 1980, if we attribute all of that to greenhouse gases, then maybe half of the uh, increase uh, since 1850 has been due to Greece and greenhouse gases. But there's a big uncertainty in that. My final question is, there was a slide I, I, uh, back a ways that said, possibly if we doubled CO2 and included clouds in our calculations, we could end up with cooling. Just wanted to touch on that. That make, I understood that correctly? Yes, you did. But this, is for, this calculation would show the negative forcing if we double CO2 was for clouds in the Western Pacific at this altitude of 11 to 13 kilometers. For other clouds at different altitudes, you do not get cooled. So the point here is not to say clouds overall cause forcing to go negative. Overall, they're probably going to cause the forcing to be less positive. I think the consensus view, uh, even when you talk about to uh, people in the global warming community, is that the forcing for clear sky of CO2, which is about three watts per square meter, when you take clouds into account, that's going to reduce it by about 30% to about two watts per square meter. But that's where there's a lot of uncertainty at the present time, figuring out what's going on in the clouds. And that's the primary reason people suspect that the global climate models have these uh, big uncertainties. I hope this has been uh, convenient. If people want to go to my website, maybe I can think, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, put it down below. There it is. Well, there we try to post uh, various articles. They're welcome to download them. I also put in a little booklet that I wrote a few years ago. I called it Is Global Warming Hot Air? And this tries to lay out the data without having all these complicated scientific equations. The bottom line, Tom, I'd like to emphasize is,
if we increase greenhouse gases, there will be some warming. But the warming is not such that there is a climate emergency, meaning that the world is going to end in 10, 20, or 30 years. So we ought to calm down about it. The world may end due to nuclear war or some dictator in North Korea does something stupid or if we have a COVID type uh, pandemic, but it is not going to end due to climate in the next few decades. All right. So thank you very much. And I'll let you go, but I really appreciate this. Thank you, Tom. Talk to you next time.